Hello and good evening Europe and good morning United States uh, and South America and Canada. Um, nice to get together with all of you uh, once again to this time to close the festival and to start the Untitled Decade. Um, like we said uh, throughout the festival, Untitled, uh, this is a start of something. It's the start of the next uh, 10 years. And I think the Untitled uh, Festival for the two days has been like uh, a collision in a particle accelerator, accelerator or where all the particles uh, like us ourselves have been going around in space and colliding into each other and into ideas and thoughts and uh, questions. This unlikely event of collision has uh, produced a lot of energy and released uh, hopefully stars of new worlds. And here we are now, some people online uh, in different corners of the world, and some people here present with us uh, in this very same space. And uh, I think we are different energies. Some, some people might be tired, but we all, even in the tiredness, I think there is something uh, buzzing in us. To create uh, and release even more energy, uh, we have next the only keynote uh, of the festival. Uh, somebody we've referred various times uh, during this festival. Someone who could be called the great poet of imagination, a philosopher, a former minister, and a professor of law at Harvard University, Mr. Roberto Mangabera Unger. Uh, we have the pleasure of him uh, pushing us uh, and provocating us towards uh, the next 10 years. Please, Mr. Uh, Mangavera Unger, floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, freedom, imagination, experimentalism, the perpetual creation of the new. These are the themes of our meeting, but they are also the possible and desirable focus of a contest throughout the world over the future of society. In these minutes, uh, I want to begin by suggesting a view of what the progressives should stand for with respect to, this, to these themes. And then to exemplify their significance for the transformation of society and for the conduct of life. The progressive should be defined by both an aim and a method or a practice. The aim is to help the mass of ordinary men and women bring their lives up to a higher level of intensity, scope, and capability, to live a larger life, to become bigger together. This idea is animated by a conception of who we are, the defining human attribute is transcendence. There is always more in us, in each of us individually, and in all of us collectively, the human race, than there is or ever can be in the social and conceptual worlds that we build and inhabit. They are finite in relation to us and we are infinite in relation to them. 
They cannot definitively accommodate us. We always spill over. This defining attribute of transcendence is also manifest in the character of the human mind. The mind has two sides. In one side, the mind is like a machine. It is modular and formulaic. But in another side, the mind is an anti-machine. It has the quality that the poet called negative capability, but that we more ordinarily name imagination. It can set aside its established methods and presuppositions to see something that those presuppositions and methods cannot allow. And then it can retrospectively develop the methods and assumptions that help make sense of what it has discovered. The relation between these two sides of the mind, the machine and the anti-machine, is not predetermined by any physical characteristic of the brain. It is shaped by the organization of society and of culture, and in this sense, the history of politics is internal to the history of the mind. The method or the practice that should define the progressives and distinguish them from the conservatives is the refusal to take the established institutional and ideological regime of present society as the outer horizon within which we must pursue our interests and ideals. The target of transformative ambition is always this structure. Now the liberals and socialists of the 19th century, unlike the social liberals and social democrats of today, understood the primacy of structural alternatives but they believed in blueprints and the different factions were defined by their, their allegiance to these different blueprints. We have a unique predicament without precedent in history. We have reason to affirm the primacy of structural alternatives, but also not to succumb to a structural dogmatism. How can we do that? We can do it only by insisting that all of the alternatives have among their characteristics, the characteristics of helping to organize their own transformation in the light of experience. And that is what we call experimentalism. Now this view of what makes a progressive progressive has an implication for the transformation of society. And one way of understanding its consequence for politics and economics is by, by analogy to the relation between a parent and a child. The parent says to the child, I love you unconditionally. Now, secure in my love, go out and raise a storm in the world. Now, there is the essence of the political project that can be responsive to the goal and to the method that I have just described. The individual worker and citizen must be secure, unafraid and capable in a haven of vital safeguards against insecurity and of capability assuring endowments. But we make him secure in this haven so that he can go out and raise a storm of experiment and innovation in the world. It's no good to focus on the first part 
without having an idea of the second part. The storm does not arise spontaneously. It needs to be arranged and aroused. And now I'm going to give some examples of what it would take in the reorganization of society to arouse this storm of the perpetual creation of the new. First, in the organization of the economy, we now have a new advanced practice of production in the world that we call the knowledge economy. It is the part of production closest to the imagination. And it requires experimentalism from those who participate in it. But in its present form, it's only an island, a series of fringes that exclude the vast majority of businesses and of people. And the consequence of this insular character is that it becomes a driving cause of both economic stagnation and economic inequality. A knowledge economy for the many can only arise through sustained experiment with the institutional form of a market economy in the relation between the government and the economic agents, whether they are businesses or individuals, but also in the regimes of property and of contract. A radicalized, disseminated knowledge economy as an instrument of liberation. The second example has to do with technology. In the traditional factory, the worker works as if he were one of his machines. But this is a perversion of the potential of technology. Everything that we have learned how to repeat, we can express in a formula or an algorithm and then embody the algorithm in a physical contraption, the machine. The point of the machine is to do for us everything that we have learned how to repeat so that we can reserve our supreme resource, time, for the not yet repeatable. And then this partnership of the machine with the anti-machine, the human being and his imagination become immensely more powerful than either of them alone. Under this view, no human being should be condemned to do the work that can be done by a machine. The third example has to do with the organization of democratic politics. All the democracies that exist in the world are relatively weak democracies that have trouble challenging the established structure of society that depend on crisis as the enabling condition of change and that therefore perpetuate the rule of the living by the dead. We want high energy democracy. One of the characteristics of a high energy democracy that loosens the dependence of transformation on trauma is that we are able to reorganize the state so that decisive action by the central government can be combined with radical devolution of power. Parts of society secede from the predominant solutions and create through their secession counter models of the national future. And then we have a dialectic of strong alternatives in society rather than a single road. My fourth example has to do with education. In a democracy, the school should not be the instrument of the state or of the family. It should be the voice of the future, recognizing in every young person a tongue-tied prophet. And one of the characteristics of the education needed for such a democracy is that every subject and every method be taught at least twice from contrasting points of view, that is to say dialectically. 
sacrificing encyclopedic superficiality to selective depth. And then the young person can be immunized early on against the life of intellectual servility that awaits him in the university culture. And my fifth example has to do with the organization of careers. If we are to enact this view that I have outlined, the individual must be able to reinvent himself in the course of his life and to change direction. And the state should assist him in his reinvention, helping to provide him with resources and opportunities for this transformation of himself. Now, it's not enough to have a program in political economy, an institutional and ideological project, because such a project advances only in historical time, not on the dimension of a human life. We don't live in historical time, we live in biographical time. And therefore, we need as well a way of living that is responsive to this vision. In that way of living, the supreme virtues are openness to the other, the other person, and openness to the new. And they are intimately related to each other. They are the secular counterpart to the Christian theological virtues of faith, hope, and charity. Now, another way of thinking about the moral implications of this vision, its consequences for the conduct of life rather than for the reorganization of society, is to describe it as a response to some of the turning points in a human life. An early turning point that we have in our youth and adolescence is that we discover that we must become something rather than everything. And therefore, uh, we must tear out part of ourselves. It's a kind of mutilation. And then later on, as we grow older, uh, a carapace of routine and compromise and of uh, the rigidified self the character begins to form around each of us, a mummy. And within this mummy, we begin to die many small deaths. To come into the possession of life and to manifest the attribute of transcendence, we must break out of this mummy. The role of the will in helping us break out of this mummy is to subject us to circumstances that we can't control for the sake of life. Now, the aim is to come into the possession of life. The price is the acceptance of a heightened vulnerability and the reward is to be able to express this attribute of transcendence, to increase our share in this divine power, to become more human by becoming more godlike, and to live in such a way that we can die only once. I wish you success in the pursuit of your hopeful discussion. Thank you so much, Professor Oker. Uh, always a delight to hear you talk. What really speaks to me is our need not only to create a safe haven, but also a storm, whereas our societies, especially our societies here in the Nordic countries, have been specialized in creating safe havens. 
it's very difficult to create storms. Uh, but now is the time uh, to discuss. Uh, Let's thank first. Thank you. <laughs> yes. So um, I think uh, Mr. Unger has uh, posed many questions to us uh, in his speech in a way, and now it's time to talk, uh, discuss about those, those questions that arise when they're connected to the Untitled 2. So we have uh, three questions to you, and um, you will be put in smaller, smaller groups to have time to ponder those. And um, those online, you will be soon sent into the breakout rooms and hear people in Helsinki uh, to, uh, make groups of three or four, um, maintaining the distance uh, between you. And can you, Robert, click the questions on? I think the questions should be visible uh, for you online. Uh, we have promised to also uh, discuss these with Unger later on, so unfortunately we cannot like every 